Okay, so we'll uh, go into the second half here. Um, I've got a lot of slides, so I'll go relatively quickly, but um, feel free to stop me at any point here. Hopefully everybody got a chance. First off, I'd like to thank the entire family, Tiffany, Lisa, and Rose, for coming today and, and being a part of this. We really do appreciate it, and the photos don't really do justice to what we see, so we appreciate that you're able to come in. Um, but you will see a lot of photos, and everything I put up here also is just from reading the notes, so if it's wrong, I apologize. <laughs> So, so we'll get going here. So I have to put this disclaimer on everything that I do. Um, these are my views. These are not Department of Defense, Department of Navy policy views or otherwise related to anything Department of the Defense, okay? So, and that's a carrier strike group, which is by far the most dangerous weapon in the world. All right, so we'll just get right into it. So. Our case presentation um, is a case that recently we did surgery on, um, and so that's the one I'll start with here. It's a 34-year-old female with a um, history of cavitary disc uh, anomaly who presented with six days of blurry vision in her left eye, which was her good eye. Um, she noted sud sudden central distortion and significantly decreased vision. She didn't have any pain, and she states that this is similar to what happened uh, in her right eye uh, many years ago. Okay, hold on one second here. I just gotta make sure. Got something. Apologize. Okay. So um, she had no other significant ocular review of systems, and uh, her review of systems otherwise was negative. Her past medical history is significant for migraine headache and PCOS. She has, again, the cavitary optic disc anomaly in both eyes, and she had a serous macular detachment in her right eye in 2007, which was repaired with uh, um, vitrectomy, endolaser, and SF6 gas at that time. Um, and then her family history is obviously significant for uh, optic disc abnormalities in both her mother and sister. Um, and she also has a grandmother who had poor vision in one eye um, that uh, died in her 30s. So, the, or excuse me, had, had vi vision problems in her 30s, but was never diagnosed as far as we know. So, so this photo was taken the day that she presented um, this, this year. So this is her current photo, and they didn't really have a good macular photo. So this is... Um, photo that we have. So on her examination, uh, visual acuity in the right eye is 2800, 2125 in the left eye. Um, and other than having had a vitrectomy and a central scotoma in the right eye, her anterior exam was otherwise unremarkable. So here is her right eye. And you can see an abnormal optic disc with uh, peripapillary um, RP dropout and hyperplasia. Um, consistent with previous laser to that area. And then um, uh, it's tough to see here, but the central macula is just slightly out of focus here. Here's her left eye. Sorry, the, the previous picture was actually from, from 2007, which was the last time we had seen her. So I apologize, this is her current picture. So you can see elevation of the um, entire macula. You can see a pseudo hole of the macula and you can see um, obvious abnormality of the uh, optic disc with significant cupping. Here is her uh, OCT of the left eye, uh, or excuse me, of the right eye, um, and you can see a serous macular detachment with uh, almost complete loss of the uh, um, inner outer segments there, due to cr which notes some chronicity to this detachment. And here's the OCT of her left eye, and you can see a large um, uh, central area of subretinal fluid with then significant amounts of interretinal fluid both nasally and temporally as well as superior and inferior. So kind of a different configuration than her right eye and that's pretty typical. We'll go into um, kind of the, the pathogenesis and what happens in these, in these eyes. And here's some photos just through her nerve, so you can superior right through the center of her nerve and then inferiorly uh, through the nerve and macula. And you can see, you can't even see the bottom of the optic cup in these. Um, and you really need a swept source OCT where you get more thickness to be able to see the, the bottom of a lot of these um, optic nerves. And then you can see her left eye here and you can see the same thing, the macular abnormality, and then as well um, just 
complete absence of any tissue posteriorly in the cup there that you can make out due to the the, dent, uh, the amount of scan we're able to get. So we'll s switch there. So that's her presentation. And now we'll go to her mother who had three weeks of vision loss in her left eye. Um, in 2014, she noticed some distortion. Um, and uh, so she presented. Um, and you can see again, she has uh, an abnormal optic nerve and she has um, serous maculopathy that looks very similar to, uh, to our pa first patient. So she went under, she underwent uh, parts plane of vitrectomy with endo laser to the, the edge of the nerve and uh, SF6 gas tamponade. And you can see one month post op to si six and 12 months. And so it took somewhere between six and 12 months for the, the fluid to resolve, um, but it slowly did over time. And this is her most recent photos and the most recent exam. She was 2030 in both eyes. And she does not have detachments in either eye. She's flat. So we'll move on to uh, um, our first patient's sister. And here are photographs from 2005 um, when she first came in for her right eye. And she was already status post uh, uh, laser, just some focal laser to the nerve um, for a serous macular detachment. She had not had surgery at that point. Um, so she was treated with vitrectomy, um, further endo laser, and SF6 gas tamponade, and she did well and flattened. And interestingly enough, this is one, um, and we'll go into this a little more with fam familial optic disc abnormalities, but you can see the progression of her nerve from 2005 through 2014 um, in the left eye. And you can see that in 2005, I would, if I didn't know better, I would call that a completely normal optic nerve. Even in 2010, I would say that's probably still normal. Um, and then in 2014, there's an obvious optic pit with significant progressive cupping. So, and that's one of the uh, um, interesting findings in these familial forms of optic disc abnormalities is they're not congenital in that sense. Um, they're definitely genetic, but they're not, um, they tend to be progressive, or certainly can be progressive. So, um, so she complained of, uh, she already had a history of having a pars plane vitrectomy with gas and endolaser in 2003 and 2005 in her right eye, but she complained of sudden vision distortion in 2014 in May. Um, in her left eye, she had distortion and her visual acuity was down. Um, and you can see she has a small uh, serous, uh, excuse me, she has a small amount of interretinal fluid there. And the optic pit, obviously, which wasn't present in 2010. So here are her post op results. And so one month you can uh, see she kind of has a serous detachment, but then two months she's almost completely flat, and three months she is completely flat. So uh, she did well until about a year post op. And then you can see the area of laser scar. If we have a laser pointer here. Nope, we don't. So she did well into about a year post-op, and this is not exactly through the fovea, um, but she's got superior fluid there. She's got the new laser, obviously, that you can see um, on both OCT and on the, uh, um, on the f color photo there. And she's got some interretinal fluid as well. So she had a reaccumulation of fluid after being completely flat. And she had focal laser and C3F8 bubbles three times over the past year, most recently in March um, for this. So I try to help it go away. So we'll move on to the discussion portion here. Those are just, again, photos of the nerves of the left eye of the two sisters. So cavitary disc anomalies, we'll just go through the common ones and kind of what they are. So optic pit is usually a focal cavitation that's isolated, usually to the infrotemporal or temporal disc. Um, they're typically small, and um, they typically have a, very, a sporadic inheritance, although there are some families that have uh, autosomal dominant inheritance of optic pits, but it's only been described a few times, it's mostly sporadic. Optic nerve colobomas are t uh, large excavations typically <coughs> located in the infrotemporal aspect of the disc, and they can be anything from just involving a little bit of the disc to involving the juxtapapillary and peripapillary tissues. 
Um, and uh, they are known mutations include PAX6, PAX2, um, there's uh, MAF, C CSH10. Um, there are no genes have been identified um, for the autosomal dominant form of colobomas, however. And these are typically sporadic as well, but there are some families with autosomal dominant inheritance which may fall into kind of our category. And then morning glory disc would be the other cavitary abnormality, and they have enlarged papilla with funnel-shaped excavations of the optic disc in the peripapillary retina. They typically have a radial arrangement of the vessels um, and in enlarged or multiple cilioretinal arteries. They have a rim of elevated peripapillary tissue, and then they tend to have a central glial pro proliferation in the base of that uh, um, disc, and that was described because it kind of looks like a morning glory flower. And again, most of these are unilateral and sporadic. Um, it's very rare, but there has been a single case report of bilateral uh, morning glory disc that included PAC6 as the gene mutation. So familial di cavitary disc anomalies have a little bit of a different, um, uh, different thing. So there's been a large four-generation family with 16 uh, individuals that have been studied out of Iowa. And they looked, at, uh, they looked at the genetics of this disease, and this was in 2007. They were able to locate, um, ab they were able to locate this to the 12Q locus by a linkage analysis, and they tested three genes, the GDF11, neuro D4, and WIF1, um, as they were all noted to be neural development um, in, in that area, and sequenced those, and they did not find any, um, any abnormalities in those genes. So at this point, the genetics are still kind of somewhat unknown, although at least we have an area to look for. And so, um, again, this case study showed four of 16 individuals had progressive um, optic, uh, optic nerve abnormalities, and 10 of 16 had bilateral involvement. There was serous maculopathy in about half of them, um, and five were bilateral. And then the phenotype varied significantly from infected, uh, excuse me, affected <coughs> individual to affected individual. There were people who were just barely kind of, because they were in the family, you look a little harder and you could see something to those who had, you know, almost a full morning glory disc type um, appearance. And again, it's autosomal dominant as well, uh, they, de they determined. And the cl some of the clinical features, about 50% will develop a serous maculopathy. The onset is typically in early adulthood, and uh, we'll go into why that's important in terms of the possible pathogenesis of this disease. Um, it, they're confined usually to the posterior pole, and they tend to have relatively poor outcomes with 80% having 2200 vision or worse um, uh, upon, upon uh, final. Uh, treatment. So the clinical pro progression of this disease, um, you know, the thought is that it normally develops in a two-step process. You get interretinal fluid um, that's extending from the optic nerve into the macula, and then if allowed to uh, continue, then you tend to get a serous, um, uh, serous detachment through what they presume is an outer retinal break basically allowing the interretinal fluid to go to, to extend into the subretinal space. So it's not actually a subretinal space optic nerve um, communication. It's actually intraretinal um, space where they tend to accumulate fluid. And so that's um, important for the pathogenesis of this disease. And usually, again, you know, just as I said, the subretinal fluid doesn't communicate directly with the optic nerve, which is kind of important. So. The pathogenesis is thought to be dysplastic retina, um, and then they have some sort of a scleral or laminal carbosa defect or enlarged, um, enlarged openings that allow uh, fluid, and then you get this dysplastic retina that protrudes into the subarachnoid space and communicates with it, either through small openings um, in the sac or through small openings in the retina. And, um, that gets important into, and this has been confirmed by histopathology as well as swept source OCT, that you see this very dysplastic retina herniating into this deep, uh, deep area of abnormality um, and then back out again, and you can actually find micro breaks on swept OCT, source OCT in the outer retina. So the two models um, and the evidence for them, although nobody's been able to confirm this, or it's either a result of vitreous traction or it's a result of pressure gradients, or some would say some of both. Um, 
the evidence for vitreous traction is that pars plane vitrectomy is the primary treatment that tends to work in these patients. And PVD, just pars plane vitrectomy with um, PVD results, at least in one small study of 11 eyes, 10 of them redetached without any laser treatment to the, to the uh, optic nerve. Um, macular buckling has also been successful, which would be more consistent with a macular track, or some sort of traction on the optic nerve or on the macula. Um, abnormal vitreous stranding is seen on swept source OCT um, in the central optic cup, and spontaneous uh, PVD can resolve um, the maculopathy without any treatment at all, and that's been shown um, in some patients. So there's also people who think that it's the differential pressure gradients between the CSF space, the intraocular space, and the subretinal space that cause this. Um, some of the evidence for that is that they've shown vitreous substitute migration, both intraocular gas as well as um, <coughs> silicone oil, has migrated into the subretinal space from the intraocular space uh, after, um, after pars plane of vitrectomy with the use of these. It's also been shown that o uh, oil has gone into the CSF space, into the subarachnoid space, um, as well as gas. So there's obviously probably some uh, overlap between these two scenarios. Um, the big variable would be that ICP actually does vary and would allow for a possible large pressure uh, gradient depending on the patient's positioning, whether they're supine or upright. Um, ICP can change significantly um, in the peripapillary area. And then they've also shown that vitreous can be incarcerated into these uh, optic disc abnormalities, thinking that it's actually kind of the pressure gradient sucking it in, sucking the vitreous into the retina um, when there's a pressure gradient. So the source of the fluid is also a question. So the source of the fluid being either liquid vitreous or CSF. So there's vitreous uh, mucopolysaccharides in this fluid. Um, India ink studies in collie dogs, which have a very classic optic pit abnormality, um, have shown that India ink from in the vitreous cavity goes into the subretinal space. Uh, and then you know, the, you've seen the subretinal fluid, uh, or excuse me, vitreous substitute migration, which also would say that this is possibly from the vitreous. But then this happens in infants who have a completely fully formed vitreous and should have really no vitreous liquefaction. So that doesn't really make sense for some liquefied vitreous getting in there. Um, again, intracranial vitreous substitute migration makes you think that there's something in the uh, subarachnoid space, a communication that allows that to, to travel there. And then also nerve sheath fenestration reports have shown that um, if, if they do a nerve sheath fenestration to lower the CSF, that can tend to resolve some of these, um, some of these detachments as well. So, and the, you know, the pressure gradient that's required to, um, if you, even if you have a 200 micron opening in the optic nerve, to allow for vitreous substitute to go into uh, another space due to tension, surface tension is about 11 to 12 millimeters of mercury. So even with a really large hole, it takes a relatively large pressure gradient to allow these things to migrate, which is why we don't see it that often. So the management of this condition is a little bit up in the air because it's not that common. But uh, pharmacologic treatments have been tried, mostly case reports um, with variable success. Uh, both the cetazolamide and corticosteroids have possibly had some effect, but it's difficult to discern because this subretinal fluid can wax and wane in an individual whether you treat them or not and either even after treatment so um, and you know that also lends a little bit of credence to the pressure gradient differential depending on um, how how much the pressure is changing uh, you can do laser photocoagulation and you can treat right through the fluid and that actually can be helpful because it can be protective of the nerve fiber layer which we're always worried about damaging when we um, when we photocoagulate in the uh, maculopapular bundle. So you try to create a very light laser burn so that it's just uptake by the RPE and into the uh, outer retinal layers and try to not injure the nerve fiber layer. And the typical is four to five rows of uh, light laser that are adjacent to the nerve, about 180 degrees temporally. So that's kind of the typical. 
Um, the surgical management, which is the most common management, would be vitrectomy, typically with a creation of a PVD, since that's thought to be possibly um, involved in pathogenesis, usually with tamponade with a gas, um, and then laser most typically, but not always. Um, and then, you know, with those, you've noted up to 90% success in some studies um, with resolution of their uh, fluid. And then macular buckling has also been performed, which is shown to, shown to work in these cases. Um, so we'll get back to our original case. So our patient underwent pars plane of vitrectomy and laser nerve to the border and SF6 gas tamponade. And she's a few weeks out from that now. So, questions for me? Comments? <laughs>